Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Effective RNA Extraction for COVID-19 Testing. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Gabrielle Fernandez de Pierola, General Manager of the Genomics and Diagnostic Solutions at Citova, uh, and Chris Nori, R&D Leader, Genomics and Cellular Research at Citiva. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during this presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the end of the presentation. Please join me now in welcoming both of our presenters, Gabrielle and Chris. I will now turn the presentation over to them. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. As uh, it was said, I'm Gabriel Fernandez Pirola. I'm the general manager of the genomics and diagnosis solution uh, business, part of Citiva. And together with uh, Chris Nori, our head of R&D, I'm going to talk about the effective uh, RNA extraction for COVID-19 test development. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have a very packed agenda. So I'm going to go straight to the introduction, which is uh, why this is important for us uh, and why we're doing it. So we took uh, this snapshot uh, just a few days ago. And as for sure you know, uh, things are even worse in terms of uh, number of people infected and number of deaths around the world. Normally, uh, as Saitiva, we remain uh, behind the curtains helping key developers around the world with our MacBeats and services and components. But in this case, we really thought we need to do uh, something more. On my personal case, I, uh, in, uh, it was in March when I was uh, uh, talking with my mom, who is a pharmacist uh, based in Spain, uh, which is one of the areas in Europe that has been mostly affected by this uh, pandemic. And she was going every day to their pharmacy uh, and she was send me, sending me pictures to me with her gloves with her mask trying to help as many people as she could and and really that pushed me and and actually everyone in the team had the same uh, other reasons to do something more than what we normally do and that's why uh, you know uh, we developed uh, the kit that uh, chris uh, will share in a few minutes uh, and that's why we continue to work for additional solutions to help with the bottlenecks of this pandemic we know that till we have a vaccine, diagnostic is the best we got, and it's important for us to contribute as much as we can uh, for this uh, for this reason. Yeah. So just to get the, the the fundamentals right, and I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with this. But uh, first, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, is not the is not, it's just the disease. It's not the virus. The virus is called SARS-CoV-2, which uh, relates to the virus that. Uh, uh, was uh, happening around 2003, which was SARS-CoV, uh, which is also called, uh, you know, coronavirus. So that's why this one we call it corona novel coronavirus, or well, sometimes new coronavirus, or sometimes coronavirus on its own. It is a placenta RNA virus, uh, which uh, being placenta means that it kind of copies itself directly, which expands uh, faster. And as you can see in the image, is uh, you know have the R it have a capsid uh, structure, uh, which means that the RNA is inside. And you have these spike proteins that are in the, in the image are on uh, red and, and orange, uh, which are the, the proteins that the, uh, the, the virus used to attack and infect the cells. So if we go uh, then closer to what are the current uh, technologies to, for COVID-19 detection, just to provide a bit, better framework. Uh, I really like this schematic because it's really simple and uh, it's, uh, it's easy to, to follow. Yeah. So, as you can see, there are really two types of detection. You can either try to detect the immune res uh, response uh, to the virus, or you can try to detect the virus itself. So if you try to uh, uh, detect the immune response, you're trying to look for an the antibodies that your body has generated. Uh, that is typically done in, in blood only, and it can be detected through a lateral flow or chemiluminescence. Now, if you're trying to identify the people that are infected, you're looking to detect the virus. And you can do two ways. You can either 
try to detect those spike proteins that were in the outside. Uh, and for that, uh, you will do a lateral flow type of test. Or you can try to find the RNA that to identify that RNA uh, of the that is inside of the virus. And for that, you will have an RT-PCR test. Both tests has some pros and cons. So the pros of the RT-PCR uh, test is that first is it can be developed really, really quickly. So as soon as you can uh, sequence the virus, which was done very, very quickly, then you can have a RT-PCR test. The second key advantage is because you are reading through the RNA of the virus, you can really have a very good uh, uh, like reliability of the test. The cons, it has to do with, the, with two things. One is the speed. Uh, in terms of the test takes to tend to take uh, longer, although different teams around the world work to shorten that time of, uh, of, of the test itself. And the second is, and, and I'm sure you have seen on the news since, since March, is uh, the different bottlenecks in different parts of the, of the process in terms of raw materials, equipment, and things like that. When you look to a lateral flow, uh, I mean, it has some very good advantages. So the test is very fast. So in minutes, you know if you have the virus or not, and they are typically cheaper. Uh, the negative side, it comes from the fact that um, because to, uh, proteins are very, very complex, which means that it takes much longer to develop uh, a, a, an appropriate uh, lateral flow test. And also, it, it is difficult to uh, get it to a level of reliability, reliability that people can get comfortable with. So I would say that uh, personally, if I want to be sure if I have the COVID or not, I will go right now for an RT-PCR test. So let's get closer on the process for uh, what is the RT-PCR. So we can simplify the, the process into just three steps. One is the sample collection you have the viral RNA purification, and finally, you have the RT-PCR amplification. There, as you can see there in the image, you have a number of ways to collect the sample. The golden standard at the moment is the upper respiratory tract. Now, if we go to the other areas, which are probably more important for us, if you go to viral RNA purification, the first step is you need to inactivate the virus because you don't want anyone to get infected with the sample if it's infected. So for that, uh, there's sometimes the uh, the transport media, like the one that uh, Chris Nori will mention will mention later from a Prime Store, for example. It has a buffer to to the buffer inactivate the virus. Uh, but also uh, the kits that are provided, uh, for example, with our magnetic beads, also provide the lysis buffer that will inactivate the virus. Then once once the virus is inactivated. The next step is to extract the RNA. You can have like uh, the typical spin column, which is very, very traditional, or you can have with magnetic bits. The advantage of the magnetic bits is that it allows you to have a much bigger automation, which when you are handling a lot of samples, that means that you have a much higher throughput. Yeah? So um, I think that's a critical aspect. And then if we talk on automation, uh, of course, you know you can still automate the spin columns, but to a certain limit. So that's mostly for the magnetic bits. And I will highlight that there are two types of uh, uh, automation platforms. You have the open platforms, and you have the closed platforms. The closed platforms are like an iPhone. It has a very nice ecosystem. Everything connects very well with each other, and everything works very well. In a situation of a pandemic, the problem with a closed system is that do you want to rely on, on one single supplier for everything, uh, especially when there's scarcity on some of the elements? Um, so, so I think that's something to take in consideration around open platforms versus closed platforms. Finally, you have the RT-PCR amplification. You can have one step or you have two steps. Um, the, there's more right now, I think it's more typical the one step versus the, the two steps just because of the simplicity. You have both the RT enzyme and the TAC polymerase together, and it gets activated through through heat, and it's relatively simple. There are a number of uh, PCR platforms uh, available, and it, we, you know, at the end of the day, the RT-PCR results is very well 
the result of how good destruction uh, did Goya. So uh, that's why uh, today we're talking mostly about the effective RNA destruction. So I will now pass it to, to, to Chris, who will talk about the product we have developed. Thanks, Gabriel. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you on this webinar today. Uh, as Gabriel mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the specific details around the kit that we've developed uh, and the importance from a testing point of view. As he mentioned, it's test touching every one of us, I think, this situation. Myself, my wife works as an ICU nurse, and so testing and understanding this, the status of patients is critical to know what kind of treatments to, to look for. And obviously, with track and trace being an important component of uh, dealing with the pandemic situation, the ability to do the testing, as Gabriel mentioned, is critical. Just to talk a little bit more about the uh, methods that we use, as Gabriel mentioned, we uh, extract the RNA sample uh, and we're using a synthetic uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA as a mimic for our assay development as well as some synthetic viral particles. So uh, it contains the SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA structure, but it's packaged into a synthetic Symbis-like virus uh, particle. We saw prepare mix the RT-QPCR uh, master mix with primers and probes, uh, and the genes that we're using for our testing are the N-gene uh, uh, probes, uh, the N1, N2, and N3 probes that people may be familiar with. We dispense the master mix, allocate a, allocate a sample of the uh, uh, test material into a plate or a tube, and run the qPCR on uh, a system uh, with the different primers and different probes. Essentially, what happens is, as you go through the different cycles, uh, the probe is converted into a fluorescent signal, and that signal increases more quickly the more of the RNA is present. And we're looking, therefore, for the cycle number that we start to see the uh, emergence of the fluorescent signal. And usually anything under 40 cycles is considered as a positive test. That test can then be reported to the clinician, or we're using that data to uh, demonstrate the efficacy of our kit, as you'll see later. In terms of the PCR reaction itself, uh, as mentioned, we extract the RNA, we allocate it, and the way the PCR reaction works uh, is basically to go through a number of heating steps in different cycles, which allows for the annealing of the probes, uh, the extension of the R uh, DNA strand, and then the dissociation to create free strand, reanneal the probes, and start that process all over again. And in every cycle, you get a doubling of the amount of uh, target that's present, uh, and therefore signal. And ho hopefully over a short period, you end up with many thousands, millions of copies uh, of the template signal, and that will give you your fluorescent outcome. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about the kit that we've developed uh, and, uh, and some of the data that comes along with, the, with that. The kit itself is based on our magnetic bead technology. We have some silica-coated magnetic beads, uh, and that allows for good automation of the samples and the systems. It allows for high-throughput nucleic acid isolation. With this kit, we can do both DNA and RNA. The data I'm going to present today is primarily focused at the SARS-CoV-2 RNA system. And what we found is that we are able to generate good quality RNA that is compatible then with downstream operations like next-gen sequencing or for the SARS-CoV-2 RNA, primarily an RT-PCR determination. Looking at some specific features of the kit, uh, it's a solid phase extraction based on the magnetic beads, and we've been able to get good sensitivity of the assay down to about one copy per microliter of, of RNA present. We can use both manual and automated methods, and that allows for very high throughput and simple uh, sample processing. We've had a range of sample volumes that we've tested, uh, up to 400 microliters of sample if necessary, uh, particularly for highly sensitivity uh, applications. It's a quick protocol, 
So it allows us to get through many samples and using multi-well plates, uh, many samples in a very short space of time. We believe it's flexible as well, having used a number of different uh, biological samples and different transport media. And I'll touch on some of those as we look at the data. And as mentioned, it's compatible then with downstream applications uh, as well. So just to spend a little bit more time uh, with the protocol itself, uh, it's a very simple protocol. And primarily the, num the way that we've tested this uh, is in a manual version. And much of the data that I'm going to present is based on a manual assay. But we've also been able to automate the process using the Kingfisher uh, system. And I'll show some of the data that we've generated to demonstrate that automation capability. Essentially, the protocols are the same. Uh, there are some um, modifications and optimizations that we've done uh, to ensure that the automation system works as, as well as the manual system. But essentially, you start with your input sample. Uh, and to that, add the lysis buffer, proteinase K, and the beads, and incubate for uh, three minutes or longer, depending on uh, the nature of the sample, potentially. After that incubation, we pull the magnetic beads to the side of the tube and remove the, the liquid. And the RNA and DNA that is bound to the beads is therefore captured in the tube. We then do a couple of wash steps. The first one uh, is with uh, ethanol, uh, and then uh, secondly with a wash buffer too. Uh, and again, you add the liquids, mix, pull the beads back to the side of the tube and aspirate the liquid away. And the RNA and DNA remains uh, bound to the beads. We do a quick air dry uh, of those beads and then add the elution buffer. And at this point, the DNA and RNA is released from the bead. So when you pull the beads to the side of the tube, you're able to aspirate out your sample, which contains the RNA or DNA of interest. So now let's take a look at some of the data that we've generated uh, with the kit uh, that hopefully demonstrates that we believe it's uh, appropriate for testing or use with the testing of the, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA virus. In our first experiment, um, what we wanted to do was take a look at the performance of the kit from an extraction perspective and just see how that compared with some published data from CDC. Um, they have data published on their uh, website using a particular kit, um, and that gives a number of uh, CT cycles or th uh, the number of cycles it takes to generate the, the signal, as mentioned before, uh, for the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. In this instance, we're using synthetic RNA. Uh, we're adding it to the prime store uh, transport media, and then we go through the protocol, as mentioned before. We're using the three N primers, N1, N2, N3, as I mentioned, and we also use an RNA P gene as a control. That data is not shown on this graph. The graph just shows the outcome for the three primer sets, uh, both at 100 copies per microliter, 10 copies per microliter, or one copy per microliter of the synthetic RNA. And in the table below, it just summarizes the, the uh, CT cycles that we observed. And as you can see, they're very comparable with the CDC data that's been published. And therefore, it gave us good indication that the ex extraction process that we're using with the kit is rendering RNA of sufficient quality to go into the downstream RT-PCR assay. In our second experiment, we wanted to extend that comparison to a more empirical test. So in this instance, we've done the same testing but this time we've done it side by side with the KIAMP mini elute virus spin kit, the one that was mentioned in the CDC previously for the data that they generated. Just to see that in, in a direct test uh, side by side that our, our extraction kit was still performing uh, in a way that was equivalent to the CDC recommended kits. And as you can see from the graphs, uh, the CT values again showing for 10,100 or one copy per microliter using each of the three primer sets uh, between the two kits is very, very comparable. And we're getting a good control uh, uh, reproducibility in the RNA's P gene as well. 
So again, this confirmed for us that the extraction process and the extraction formulation that we've developed is providing the right kind of RNA outcome to be able to do detection at a sensitive level for the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. I mentioned the importance of automation, particularly when it comes to processing high throughput samples. So this next experiment was looking at a comparison between the manual method and the automated method. This is using the Serra Extractor Kit, again with the Prime Store transport media and the three primer sets and RNAs P as our control. And again, what we can see is at the different concentrations of synthetic RNA added, 10,000, 100, and one copy per microliter, we're getting very comparable results between the manual method and the automated method. And this means that we can use automation to really speed up uh, the number of samples that we can do in a testing type situation and be confident that we're able to detect the virus at the same level of sensitivity as the manual method. In the next slide, we know that there are other uh, transport media that people are most commonly using. Uh, the prime store media is a media that is an inactivating media, as Gabrielle mentioned previously. But there are also a number of transport media that are non-inactivating media. And one of the most common ones is a media called the Cohen UTM. In these types of media, the virus is not inactivated. It's simply stabilized. Um, and so potentially has a different kind of environment when it goes into the extraction process and then onward into RT-PCR. So we wanted to test the effectiveness of the extraction kit with these non-inactivating uh, transport media. So the data here you can see uh, is again using the synthetic RNA um, in the kit uh, together with a manual method and an automated method using this time the COPAN transport media. Again, we're able to detect virus, but this time only down to about 10 copies per microliter um, robustly. Uh, we still see good performance of the RNA's P primer set throughout the dilution set. But this did raise some questions as to what was happening in the um, non-inactivating uh, transport medias. And one of our concerns was that because we're only using synthetic RNA, it was actually that the RNA was being degraded uh, as, as it was placed into that transport media, and that therefore we weren't able to detect the sensitivity levels that we had been able to do so previously in the prime store media. So in order to investigate that further, we took a look at a different kind of uh, sample. In this instance, as I mentioned, we're using recombinant viral particles. So here we've got the SARS-CoV-2 RNA, but it's now packaged into a synthetic recombinant virus based on the Symbis virus. Again, using the non-inactivating transport medias, and again, comparing the manual with the automation method. And in this instance, we're able to get down to five viral copies per microliter. And this time the, the data is very consistent, and it's very consistent between both the manual and the automated method. And this really convinced us that uh, it's likely that with the uh, non-inactivating media, we are suffering from degradation of the synthetic RNA. When you protect that RNA in a, in a synthetic viral species, then again, you're able to recreate the same kind of sensitivity as we were able to see in the non-inactivating media. So, what I'd like to do just to finish is summarize some of the key points in terms of the performance of the kit that we have. Our virus kit is designed to e extract nucleic acids from both RNA and DNA viruses and other uh, pathogen species. Although we focused primarily on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, data in this presentation, we have also generated data with uh, an influenza virus, so as different RNA virus, but also with some bio, uh, DNA pathogens also, uh, adenovirus, and also with a bacterial species. I've demonstrated and shown that we can use a variety of universal transport medias, both inactivating and non-inactivating. And we've also got data that demonstrates that we can uh, recover the RNA from a variety of biological species. In our experiments, we're primarily using RNA that's uh, 
spiked into those transport medias. But we know through customer uh, interactions that people are using swab-based samples in those in those medias, saliva samples, and we've also tested blood in some of the, the uh, data that we've created elsewhere. The yields that we get and the quality that we get are very reproducible, and we've been able to demonstrate that we're continually able to detect at sensitivity levels down to one copy per microliter uh, using the RT-PCR assay. Uh, so we have a good uh, quality of RNA produced from the extraction method. There's good flexibility in terms of the sample that can be used, both in terms of volume, but also how it can be handled, both in manual and automated fashion. And that gives great flexibility for users uh, and in terms of how they're doing their testing, uh, be it manual or needing higher throughput using automation. And the process can take a very short space of time, can be completed in about 30 minutes. And when you're multiplexing that in, in 96 or greater density plates, allows for a very high throughput capability. One of the things that I haven't been able to show here, but we've been working on more recently, is to expand that menu of the different types of pathogen species that we're able to detect, and also to look at the flexibility of the method on automation platforms. We've been able to look at things like the heating step, the mixing steps, and the incubation steps. And there is flexibility there that we can introduce into how the protocol runs, therefore giving even greater flexibility for different sample types, different testing environments, et cetera. And with that, I'd like to hand back to Gabrielle to finish the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, now uh, we have many other uh, technologies we, we, that we use to support COVID-19. So let me share it, that with you. So if we look to uh, COVID-19, so we can help with the sample preparation. We can help with detection uh, with the RTQPCR. Uh, we can mention, help with sequencing, which is another way to detect the virus. And then we, we help along the whole process with our, our customized solutions. So let me talk to you briefly about each of them. So on the customized solutions, uh, there's some sessions in particular on, on live stable. Uh, this is a technology that we have uh, to stabilize um, uh, companies' reagents. So they are able to be stored uh, at room temperature when normally they will they were, they were stored at very negative temperatures. We have a big project, for example, with a company in the UK called Gene Drive, which is very public and very successful. Uh, and we have, but we have many others on the way. We have uh, also services of uh, contract manufacturing and formulation beyond uh, the, the live stable. Then if we go down to the different steps, so on sample preparation, you know, we talked uh, about the virus and, uh, and pathogen kit, but on top of that, we have a full range of magnetic bits. For example, the Cerasil bits are used um, actually for the Cerastracta virus and pathogen kit. So if uh, we help uh, companies that want to build their own kits or want to build their own workflows using their own buffers. Uh, with, the, with those bits. And sa same way with the Ceramac bits. So we have carboxyl, oligo DT that, that are widely uh, documented to be used for uh, extraction of RNA. And uh, actually, we know they're actually used for COVID-19 as well. On top of that, we have uh, poly-A, which is a reagent that helps uh, enhance the sensitivity of the assays. We have a lot of stock of that one. And then we have uh, uh, our spin, RNA spin columns and the plate format uh, that actually does the RNA extraction as well. So that's on sample preparation. Uh, for detection, we, we have uh, some products there on nucleotides, tag polymerase, and, and side dyes. And then on, on, on sequencing, uh, we have basically it's mostly about our ceramic beads, uh, which are used all across the process. So now talking on sequencing on an NGS workflow, uh, and just a side of what is uh, COVID-19, uh, we have built uh, a number of products uh, around the Serstracta kits uh, that work uh, on the NGS workflow. So on top of the virus and pathogen kit, uh, we, have our, we have launched earlier this year the cell-free DNA kit and the genomic DNA kit, uh, which is a full kit to extract DNA and a full kit to extract uh, cell-free for liquid biopsies. Uh, we also have a, a product for RNA isolation will be similar to the to the other page and for FFP isolation amplification and then on the library preparation 
Of course, we have, uh, you know, our full reagent, uh, Ceramax Select, uh, and also Exopro Star um, uh, to, to help the PCR cleanup. So that's kind of a really quick overview of, of our products. I would like to highlight that uh, our products overall have been used uh, for um, a, a, to enable at least uh, 50 million uh, PCR tests around the world. So, so I think it's, it's a very good contribution for, for uh, our side and really looking forward uh, for your questions now or, or, or later. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gabrielle and Chris, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. And as a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. So let's take a look. We already have an incredible number of questions coming in for you, gentlemen. Our first question is, most patients tested for COVID-19 must have developed symptoms, meaning that the viral load must have been high to cause these symptoms. Can this kit also give good sensitivity for patients with less symptoms or lower viral loads? Yeah, sure, let me take that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, with the testing that we've been doing, as, as mentioned in the data, we've been getting sensitivities of around one copy per microliter using the synthetic RNA uh, and down to a couple of copies per microliter for the viral particles. With some of the uh, testers that have tried the kit um, with real samples uh, in the field, when they've got a patient that's got a clear viral load for the, for the virus, they're getting CT values of around 20 or even lower, uh, 18, 20 levels. Uh, as I indicated, we can still get that one copy per microliter at CT values of around uh, 35 to 40, um, indicating that there's a huge degree of sensitivity in the assay uh, compared to those patients that have had the, the really uh, visible symptoms, as it were, and high viral load. So yes, we believe that it does give good sensitivity for uh, the lowest, the less symptoms uh, or early stage uh, of the virus, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And can one use this kit for extracting nucleic acids for testing other viruses, for example, seasonal flu or even some blood-borne viruses? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think with one of the first application notes that we published on the website, um, we did some uh, data with both the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also with influenza and also with a, a, a DNA species as well. So whilst we've focused our attention, um, I think quite rightly at this time on, on testing and if efficacy of the extraction method for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, it is certainly applicable to other uh, RNA and DNA pathogen types. Uh, and certainly we have some pr uh, data with the, the influenza virus as well, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Our next question is, is this kit certified for IVD use? Well, I, I can take that one. Uh, so uh, it is not certified for IVD use and it's not our intention to certify it for IVD use. Uh, this is only an REO kit. Uh, so and we want to allow uh, the companies or labs that are signing or, or testing with an RTQ PCR uh, the chemistry to validate the results th themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, because we think that the IVD status is more important on the de detection part than on, on the extraction kit. So that's why uh, we have done it this way. Also, I have to mention that, you know, because that's kind of our view of, it, of things, we're very happy also to, uh, to kind of make custom versions of this, uh, of this kit to facilitate this process for any company who's interested to, to, to kind of apply for that, for that market. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Our next question, and I want to thank again our audience members for these great questions coming in. We are having a supply issue with our current extraction kit provider. Can you confirm that you have a full supply of chain control of this kit? Well, uh, yes, actually I can take that one again. Uh, uh, so yes, so uh, since, you know, as I was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, you know, we uh, kind of normally are provider of components for this type of kits. Uh, we manage the full supply chain. So we have control of the full supply chain. And, 
Uh, and I have to say that we have a, a lot of capacity for, for producing tests uh, on this one. So, so we have a very good kind of uh, security of supply for, for our customers in this one. Yeah. Thank you so much. Our next question, would it be possible for us to have the kit in bulk volumes outside your standard 96 reaction kit, for example? Yeah, well, uh, yes. So actually we have uh, the, the 96, but also we have a 1,000 one reaction kit, which also allow us, as I was mentioned uh, before, to address like really high demands of, uh, you know, up to millions of reactions. Yeah, so, so yes, so we can do a 1,000 reactions. And as I was saying before, uh, because of the nature of how we deal with our customers, uh, we can even do other customized versions as well. Yeah. But uh, we, we can do bulk. That's what the answer is uh, yes. Thank you so much. Now, gentlemen, what type of magnetic bead is used in this kit? Yeah, so um, as mentioned, what we have is a mag uh, magnetite super paramagnetic bead. Um, so it, that allows us for the uh, uh, the protocol to run in a very convenient manner. So the, the beads only come to the magnet when the magnet is applied and then can go back into solution very readily afterwards. <clears throat> but um, the surface chemistry is a silica-based chemistry um, and people will be familiar with that for nucleic acid extraction uh, on a number of different methodologies uh, historically. Uh, we've been able to apply the same surface chemistry to these magnetic particles and therefore it gives us a, a familiar type of but in a very convenient format using the magnetic beat. Yeah, if I, if I may add, uh, and just to be yes. more, uh, more concrete, yeah. So, so the beads that actually we have used in these kits, uh, which have all the characteristics that uh, Chris has said, are our Seracil magnetic beads. So, uh, and uh, as we want to, you know, to, to kind of contribute as much as we, uh, as we can, and is, is our way of, uh, of, of, of working uh, with our customers, we're also willing to, you know, to, to, and we are commercializing those bits on their own. Uh, so if you want to, to do your own kit, uh, we're more than happy to help you with that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we have a similar question around the magnetic beads. Our audience member wants to know, for RT-PCR COVID test, which is the effective way of isolation? Is it magnetic bead based or is it glass fiber spin columns? Yeah, so effectively both methods can be used. Um, the um, uh, Kiogen kit that was mentioned in the data is a column-based kit. Um, and hopefully what you've seen in the data is that the magnetic-based kit that we've provided gives equivalent sensitivity and capability in terms of that extraction. What we believe, though, is that the magnetic beads offer more flexibility when it comes to the numbers of samples uh, that, that the operator has for testing. Uh, they can be done manually in small numbers with uh, little manual magnetic racks. So you can do anywhere up to a dozen tubes in a, in a single rack, for example. But also it means that it can be translated onto automation platforms uh, where you have 96 or even 384 well handlers uh, with magnetic plates on the deck. And so that convenience in terms of being able to go from small numbers right up to very high throughput numbers uh, we believe offers equivalent performance from the extraction point of view, but much greater flexibility from the user perspective. Thank you so much. Now, which automation platform is the kit compatible with? So in theory, it should be compatible with, with any uh, automation system that has a magnetic separation capability. Uh, in terms of the data that we presented, we've been using the uh, Kingfisher Duo system, um, which is a, a small benchtop unit, um, allows up to 96 well um, handling of, uh, of the testing. Um, but we know we've worked with customers that have also used uh, the really high throughput, fully automated liquid handling units like a Hamilton uh, system, for example, um, but other uh, similar capabilities are provided by many, many automation um, uh, suppliers. And as I say, as long as they have the magnetic um, capability to do that magnetic separation, should be compatible with, with any type of automation platform. Thank you so much. Now, how should Sarah extract a virus pathogen kit be stored? 
Yeah, so the, the kit is provided with a number of components that are all proven stability at room temperature. Um, so uh, on arrival, the kit can be stored at room temperature. Um, there is one component in the kit, which is the proteinase K. Um, that once it's reconstituted, we suggest storing that at colder temperatures. Um, but it, but that's once you've opened the package, as it were, and started using the kit, uh, then that component perhaps needs uh, storing separately. Uh, but otherwise, it's a room temperature stable kit. Thank you so much, Chris. We have time for a few more questions. And again, I want to thank our audience for this great um, Q&A live discussion. Could 903 cards be used for sample collection in collaboration with the RNA DNA extraction kit? Absolutely, yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And interestingly, something that we did look at uh, very briefly, and, and we have published uh, some information on this onto the website as well. Um, so yes, we used um, some 903 cards spiked with the similar samples to the ones that I described in the in the talk. Uh, and we were able to get effective uh, extraction of the RNA from those cards. So in, th in theory, yes, that, that's a, a feasible route to take for uh, sample collection. Thank you so much. And similarly, another question around extraction. The extraction is performed with a cocktail of beads. Can you expand on that? And is the ratio kept the same for both the RNA and DNA extraction protocols and different starting material? Uh, yes, at the moment, the, the, the recipe and the protocol that we're suggesting is the same for all of the, the um, sam sample targets that we've tested so far. Um, our plan moving forward is to try and expand that range of targets uh, that we can demonstrate effect efficacy with, with the kit. Um, I think if we do find that anything changes in respect to that cocktail, then uh, we'll make sure to publish that data. But so far, what we've seen is that that cocktail and the recipe works consistently for uh, a number of different pathogen targets that we've been able to measure so far, yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, how are you helping kit developers like Genadrive with manufacturing? Can you meet the capacity requirements? Yeah, I can take that one. So, uh, yeah, so with Gene Drive, we are not uh, uh, working on the uh, extraction side. Uh, it is uh, they're developing the, the RT-PCR uh, type of things, and what we do with them is uh, what is a live stable technology, uh, which is uh, stabilizing their reagents, uh, so that normally those kits need to be stored at a minus uh, 30 degrees or something or even uh, colder. And with our technology, we are able to stabilize that uh, those reagents so they are stored in a room, room temperature yeah and uh, and so that's the type of work we have been doing with, with gene drive and other manufacturers around the uh, around the globe uh, on on the on the reagents perspective uh, and uh yes yeah, so, so in terms of the capacity for that I, I i think there's other sessions other webinars for that but the category is the, the capacity is really really uh, big yeah yeah we're talking on millions yeah um now uh, with other kit developers uh, you know we're supplying uh, beads and we are supplying as well the the, the kit on the, on itself, and and you know I think there was some some mention uh, that that we have we were estimating that uh, uh, I think till a couple of months ago we already helped to enable more than 50 million uh, PCR tests around the globe, yeah, which is I, I think that does give you a, a sense of what is the capacity kind of uh, uh, that we we may may address yeah, in, into the into this uh, problem, yeah. Thank you so much. It looks like we have a couple more questions here. Do you sell the synthetic RNA as a positive control? Uh, we don't at this time. No, we, we uh, acquired that uh, positive control from, from someone else for our testing, uh, and we don't have that in our, our product range. Um, if, that, if that was of interest, um, it, it would be good to know what sort of um, uh, amounts and what sort of use the, the customer would feel that that would be beneficial for in their hands uh, to run alongside the, the testing process. Uh, so maybe if there's uh, a further information required or further uh, discussion required, um, perhaps there's a way of connecting up in the, um, in the conference hall around that one. Wonderful, perfect. Now, how effective is rapid antigen um, testing in comparison to RT-PCR for COVID? 
Do you want to take that one, Gabriel? That was in your introduction. Yeah, sure, sure. sure. I, yeah, yeah, and you know, you know more the technical side. So, so if, from my uh, how I how I'm looking to it. So as I was mentioned at the beginning of the of this talk, uh, you know, the, the doing a test with through uh, trying to identify the antigen because of the complexity of the uh, of it. It takes longer, and it is more difficult to really have that level of of kind of reliability. Uh, while with a PCR test, because you just read the the, the sequencing of the RNA, uh, th then you can get it uh, faster. But then you have other constraints that I was mentioned before. Yeah. Um, so I think right now there's a bit of a race, no? Uh, and I think it's very interesting because you can see, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of companies working on a rapid antigen uh, kit, and we ha we're collaborating uh, with some of them to help them to to to, to do that from the Saitiva side. Uh, and then on the other side, you have a lot of ways that uh, the PCR-related uh, kind of assays are being improved in terms of time, in terms of cost, in terms of simplicity. Um, so uh, uh, it is. Uh, I don't think this uh, right now probably the gold standard. In it remains the PCR. Uh, I, we don't know what will happen in the next six months. Uh, that may change or that may not. Uh, I don't know, uh, Chris. What are your take? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think the other um, important characteristic of the PCR test is because of the amplification amplification process, the sensitivity is is extremely high with the with the PCR based tests. Um, I must admit, I'm not I'm not up to date with exactly how far the antigen tests have, have progressed. And certainly, as Gabriel mentioned, you know, there, there's undoubtedly going to be in the future very effective anti antigen testing capabilities uh, available as well. I think at the moment, as, as he mentioned, in terms of that gold standard and particularly in terms of sensitivity, I, I think PCR is is probably still the the preferred route. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your presentation today. It's been fabulous. I want to offer you an opportunity to maybe provide some closing remarks. Um, Gabriel, would you like to say anything to the audience before we go today? Sure. Uh, so, you know, we are uh, here at Saitiva not to help as much as we can uh, with this pandemic. And we are happy to do in whatever way. You know, we can help with the, the extraction kits that we're doing. We're happy to provide the customized. We're, we're happy to provide the bids. We're happy to pro, to help with other reagents. We are happy to to help with other side uh, of the, of this kind of uh, diagnostic event. So yes, uh, reach out to us uh, because you know that's our way of working is really collaboratively with uh, to to just to bring solution into this pandemic. Yeah? And 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 uh, yeah, uh, that's my, my my thoughts. Yeah. And Chris. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd just like to re reiterate that collaborative piece. Uh, I mean, it's a it, it's a strange time for everyone at the moment. And I think we've been very keen to work as closely as possible with customers to understand their need, not just so that we, you know, we have a good product on the market, but to help with the situation that, that is facing us all at the moment and ensure that we have the best possible reagents available to ensure that testing is successful. Uh, which I think is, is as we mentioned at the start, is critical uh, to help um, you know resolve some of the the, the things that are happening right now. Um, so yeah, if people have questions or, or or need more help or more information, we're we're more than happy to to help. Thank you both again for your presentation. And I also want to thank our audience members for their interesting questions and their participation today and remind you that any questions that were not able to be answered today will be answered via email. And this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing for 12 months. So please remember to share it with your colleagues who may have been interested in the topic and missed today. And do not miss the other presentations on our agenda. Visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again for your participation. Thank you, gentlemen. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.